Federico, and this is Peter Wiglevin. We're here to talk to you about Windows Virtual Desktop, but I'm sure many of you have already heard enough about it today. So Peter's also going to do a bunch of really cool demos. And then we have a surprise guest coming on stage, a current uh, early adopting customer to talk through their experience. But first, let's take a step back. Let's make sure we're all thinking about Windows Virtual Desktop and cloud-based desktops the same way. So on our team, at least, this is how we're viewing many of the main scenarios for desktop and app virtualization today. So, Oh, it looks like the slides aren't transitioning over. OK, after that. So <laughs> the <laughs> scenarios for desktop and app virtualization. Security and regulation, huge existing scenario, but it's even easier with the security of M365 and Azure. Elastic workforce so you can scale up and scale down, whether it's structural, seasonal, or contractor and partner-based access that you're looking to be able to ebb and flow with your business. Specific employees as you start to evaluate your device strategy, maybe with bring your own device or the use of mobile devices, whether exclusively or as an add-on. And specialized workloads, historically many of them very difficult to run on-prem, such as design and engineering, where it required a lot of resources. But now with the leveraging a lot of the new SKUs in Azure, whether it's N-series um, or some of the high-performance computing offers, you can start to use different scenarios that are unblocked or unlocked with Azure and Windows Virtual Desktop. So I'm sure anybody who's seen anything about Windows Virtual Desktop has seen this slide before. But really all I want to land here is that truly is the integration of four of Microsoft's largest businesses and products to date. You have Microsoft 365 with Windows 10 and Office 365 and that new multi-session Windows 10 experience that is optimized and designed to run perfectly with Office 365 Pro Plus on Azure. And support where you are with Windows Server and your remote desktop services environments. Bring them as is and virtualize them on Azure with Windows Virtual Desktop. And the last one always seems obvious when you're talking to someone about something that runs on Azure, but it's pretty amazing that you could go from what could have taken 6, 12, 18 months or longer to deploy an environment to just a short period of time. And actually, the person we're going to have to come on stage a little bit later is going to tell you how fast it actually was for them. But don't take it just from me. We've had a number of key recognizable customers that are already using this service today, whether it's manufacturing, financial services, healthcare, education. A number are already using this, and the number is about over 13,000 customers that have already piloted the service to date. But it's all really being captured because of the excitement and interest of Windows 10 multi-session. This ability to bring the left side and the right side of this together, the Windows server scalability, and the Windows 10 native modern experience of Windows 10 together, and not having to compromise in what you provide your end users. But all of this value and benefit doesn't just apply to native Windows Virtual Desktop. We also announced a huge partnership with a really key partner of ours, Citrix, and their cloud environments that are available today. When we generally went generally available about six weeks ago, they went generally available on day one. And you can get a number of value from hybrid or unified work experience, whether it's image or environment management. And then in May of this past year, we actually announced a partnership at Dell World with VMware for the Horizon Cloud on Azure solution to integrate with Windows Virtual Desktop and extend the value that they provide. So whether you're using a Citrix environment, a VMware environment, or you want to use a native solution, you can pick and still run Windows Virtual Desktop and get all of the value I was just talking about. And the partners don't stop there. It's a huge, robust partner ecosystem that's continuing to grow every week. And you see there's systems integrators, value-added partners that provide unique value, whether it's assessment, monitoring, whether it's scaling and optimizing your Azure environment, or you can go down to the, the hardware partners, and if you saw Scott's session yesterday, you saw the announcement around iGel and the support for Linux thin clients and the SDK coming. So it really is not stopping, and you can pick whatever solution you want. And of course, something that often is asked is how do I get it? Well, great news, most of you already have it. And if you're, if you're virtualizing Windows 10 today, you already likely have one of these licenses and it's already included, whether it's Windows 10 or Microsoft 365 E3 and above, that includes education. Or if you're virtualizing Windows Server and remote desktop services, you can use your RDS Cal with SA. So really bring what you already have and virtualize it on the cloud with Windows Virtual Desktop. And only pay for what, you, what the users actually consume. 
And you can optimize that, and you'll hear again more examples of that kind of optimization a little bit later, but use Azure reserved instances for the compute, and store, the compute you know. And really exciting, about a month and a half ago, we announced monthly payment options for those Azure reserved instances. So you can have your long-term commitment, but pay on a monthly basis and for that predictability of your um, desktop and app virtualization on Azure. And last but very much not least, this is not just the integration of a number of products. It's actually an integration of a security story for Microsoft and for Windows Virtual Desktop. You have Microsoft 365 and all of the value that conditional access, multi-factor authentication, bring together with the power of Azure and the investments in cybersecurity and compliance to be the most trusted cloud. And Windows Virtual Desktop, and Peter's gonna talk a lot more later about some of the really cool things as he's doing these demos, but Reverse Connect allows you to not have to open inbound ports so you can truly harden your environment as much as you absolutely want, as you want for a secure Windows Virtual Desktop environment on the cloud. But don't take it from me, watch Peter go through some really cool demos now and show you just how easy it is. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, how to set up Windows Virtual Desktop. But before we do that, let's quickly spend a minute or maybe two to talk about the high-level architecture. Uh, who's seen this slide before or a version of it? All right, so that's a good 10%. So maybe let's spend an extra minute on this slide. <laughs> um, if you look at the boxes or the sections on the right, let's start at the bottom right. You can see we have uh, the managed by Microsoft, which has compute, storage. That's just Azure. Azure abstracts all of the hardware for you. Nothing new, Azure's been around for a while. On the top right, you see the six roles that are defined. Now, for those of you who installed on-premise RDS environments, you know you have to purchase hardware, you need to install Windows Server, you need to domain join them, install additional roles, uh, probably you want to have some kind of redundancy, so you need to double, maybe even triple the amount of servers, then expose them to the internet. And if something goes wrong, because there are many moving parts and wheels, you have to troubleshoot. All of this is now offered uh, by, as a managed service by Microsoft. And these are not just VMs running in Azure. These are completely from the ground up written web applications. So we can scale up and down relatively easy. The only thing that we require you to bring is your own Azure subscription. That's the part in the middle. That's where the operating systems are deployed. Now you choose whether you wanna deploy Windows 7, Windows 10 Enterprise, Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session that John talked about, um, or even Windows Server. You can see we have Windows Server 2012 R2 and up on the slide, but we're also working on 2008 R2. The thing you do, and this is something I'm gonna show you soon, is you install an agent on one of those VMs, that reaches out to our management plane, that's the outbound connection that John talked about, and then whenever someone connects, we kinda broker the connection in Azure, so no inbound ports have to be opened, uh, and we can use things like Azure Active Directory identities, lighting up conditional access and MFA and all of those goodies. So that's very high level how Windows Virtual Desktop is architectured. Now, if you wanna spin up your own environment, um, the one thing uh, I would recommend you to go is to this link at the left. It will bring you to a, a blog page that we created and it will show you all the steps you need in order to spin up your own environment. Because right now, and this is something you'll see, there's a lot of PowerShell involved and we have to go to the portal and we're working on improvements and I'll talk about that. Um, but this blog will show you step by step what to do to spin up your own environment. Before you do that, you have to answer a couple of key questions. So one is, what kind of identity strategy do I have? The virtual machines that you deploy in your subscription, they have to be domain joined. So one of the questions we get very often is, what about native Azure AD support and Intune management? And that's something we're working on very hard and it's coming. But until that point in time, you need to AD join your VMs. So the key question is, where are you gonna domain join them to, and where does this thing live? And you got a few options, you can see them here on the slide. One is using Azure ADDS. You could think of it as a domain controller as a service. So you spin it up, it runs 24 seven, which could be a pro or a, or a com, um, and then you can domain join 
your VMs to ADBS, Azure ADBS. The second option is spinning up a VM, installing Windows Server, promoting it to a domain controller, and using that to domain join your VMs. The last option, and these can be combined, is by using ExpressRoute or just VPN to extend your on-premise network to Azure so that if you domain join a virtual machine, it can find your domain controller running on-premises. The second step that you need to think about is profile management. Who heard about FS Logix? All right, that's a lot better. That's like 40%-ish. Um, so for those who have not heard about FS Logix, typically in a multi-session or non-persistent multi-session environment, it means you have dozens of virtual machines or physical machines running. And every time when you connect to the service, you're assigned a almost random virtual machine. So today you're working on VM1. Tomorrow, you're maybe working on VM2. Now, the first day you log on, let's say, first time you connect to the environment, you, um, you open up Outlook, you have to specify your email address, Outlook will start downloading all of your cache, your OST file. Same thing with OneDrive, you know, it will download all your hydrated files. OneNote will download the cache. Now, the second day, when you connect to your environment, you don't want to go through that same experience. That's horrible. It's like getting a new device every day. It's a horrible experience. So what FS Logix does, it creates a virtual hard drive that lives outside of the VM, and it connects or it mounts across the network to your Windows, uh, to your virtual machine, and it will mount to see users your username, which is your profile. So anything that's downloaded, Windows thinks it's local, but it's not. It's actually a virtual hard drive living outside of the VM. The next day, when you authenticate to another VM that you've never seen before, FS Logix will just quickly mount that virtual hard drive to that other VM, and all your files are there. You launch Outlook, everything's there. It just feels like the same machine you were using yesterday. So it's pretty beautiful. It's a very elegant solution. But you are prompted with the question, where do you store that profile? Now, you've got a couple of options. You can spin up your own uh, file server, uh, but probably you want that thing to be redundant as well, so the costs are increasing. Uh, the other option is using Azure Files, and that's something I will show you. Uh, the third option is using Azure NetApp Files. And uh, the last two, you could see them as a file share as a service. So instead of running the whole uh, or managing an another server, this is all done for you. And it has specific benefits that we'll talk about. Lastly, make sure you have all the credentials needed. It's quite a few, so if you work for a large enterprise, or uh, you're a partner working for a large enterprise, you probably have to work with a few departments. Several people, I see people nodding over here. Um, so you need some people having the right credentials in order to make the whole end-to-end -end scenario work. All right. So now uh, let's go to the first demo. Um, we have three demos. The first one, we're gonna deploy a full desktop. Um, we, there are several ways of doing that. One is by using our marketplace offering. You go to the Azure portal, you search for Windows Virtual Desktop, and there is a wizard that will guide you through the deployment steps. That's not what we're gonna do. Um, mainly because we've shown that so many times, what we're gonna do here is the manual way, which also means we're gonna dive into PowerShell. So if you're afraid by PowerShell, just close your eyes, you know, we'll snap when you can wake up again. All right, so here we're looking at my uh, script that I prepared, and it's doing a, a bunch of things. So first, what we're gonna do, I actually did this already, so I'm gonna skip it, is install the PowerShell models, modules that we need for Windows Virtual Desktop. The second thing is setting a few variables. The first one is not unique, or it's the same for everyone, um, and the other ones are just specifying my tenant name and my host pool. Now, this, the next thing, you can see something with a token. So what does that mean? The last thing you want is if you create a host pool, and, and by the way, for those of you who don't know what a host pool is, it's uh, a pool of hosts. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it's slightly more than that. It's typically all the VMs that belong to the same host pool are uh, identical as much as possible, and they serve a meaning, like maybe there's a host pool for the finance department or offering specific use cases or applications. 
The last thing you want is that some stranger can join virtual machines to your host pool. So that's why we create a token, we export that, and when we enroll the machine into the host pool, we have to provide this token, and that's something I'm gonna show you. So like mentioned before, I've already, just in the interest of time, uh, I've already executed these things just before my presentation started, mainly because it takes a minute and it throws a pop-up where I have to enter my credentials and I'll probably make a bunch of typos with a thousand people watching me. So I, I skipped that. Um, and the first thing that we need to do is create a new host pool. So that's the command over here, which I've already done. So if I execute this, it should throw an error saying that this host pool already exists. So here you go, it says Ignite Demo, which is the name of my host pool already exists. The next thing, we have a host pool, but no one has access to it yet. We need to provide a user that can actually access this host pool. And in my case, that's this user, which is called ignite at cspeter.com. So if we execute this command, this user, and we'll check this later, should have access to uh, this host pool. The last thing is this token that we talked about. So I'm just gonna export the token. And if I browse to my C drive, let me just show you the command, by the way. So this thing exports the token and writes it to this variable, which happens to be C uh, column and then just token.txt. So if I open that file, here you can find a huge string, which is, you could see it as a, as a password, and we will need this in the next step. So again, this may sound very complex, and it is. Uh, you can also use the marketplace offering if you prefer a GUI. This is the manual way. So the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna remote just traditional remote desktop into one of the VMs that I'm gonna add to this host pool. I just did a few things. One, I made sure that this virtual machine is domain joined. So over here, you can see if I zoom in a bit, this thing is just traditionally domain joined to my, in my case, it's ADDS running here. The second thing I've done is I've installed Notepad++. I just downloaded it, I ran through the installer, it ended up here, that's all. And that's something we're gonna need for our next demo. Now, if we wanna add this, this VM to our host pool, we have to download the agent. So this, this is something you'll find in our documentation. Um, and that's actually two parts. There's an agent and there's a bootloader. So let's just download this. Here they are. And let's start with the agent installer. I'll minimize this stuff so you can see it better. And let's just follow the instructions. We'll hit next. And here I'm prompted for my token. So that's the thing that we just exported. I'm gonna paste it in here. Click next, install. And this should be done in a matter of seconds. What this agent does is it reaches out to our service, it does a handshake, it validates to see if my token is correct, it join, joins the host pool that we defined earlier, and it's responsible for pretty much everything. The other component that you saw, the bootloader, this thing, we also need to install it. And this one makes sure that whenever the agent is outdated, it will update the agent. So it's like an auto-updater process responsible for making sure you're always running the latest bits. The good thing about this is you never have to update your agents. That's something that we take care of. We'll make sure that happens just fine. Okay, so that's all we need to do. And of course you can automate this. So now let's see if this thing actually worked. And for that we're gonna use our HTML5 client. Um, and here I've already um, entered the username of that uh, user that we're gonna use to test. And if all goes well, we should have one desktop assigned to this user. And let's see if it works. The HTML5 client is pretty cool because you can use this on any device. Any device with a capable browser can be used. 
Now we also have clients available for other operating systems, including iOS, Mac, Windows, Android, mm -hmm. Android, pretty much all major operating systems out there. Now you might wonder why are you entering credentials twice? The first one is for Azure AD identity, so this is where you can apply conditional access and MFA. The second one is in order to get access to Windows. And again, we're working on Azure AD support, which should just eliminate all of this. We can give true single sign-on into your VMs. So here we go, the resolution is a bit poor because of the setup here. Um, we could enlarge it a little bit. It's still not great, um, but you get the hang of it. You can get access to your virtual machine by just using a browser. This is the VM that we just enrolled into WDD. So let's um, see what our next demo is about. And this is about deploying a remote app. So you just saw how we can deploy a full desktop experience to a user with the HTML5 client. Now we're gonna do something else. We're gonna publish Notepad++, the thing I installed inside of my VM. We're gonna offer it as a remote app. So ideally, you only see the output of the application itself. And then instead of using the HTML5 client, we're gonna use the Windows client, which has the best integration with the operating system itself. You'll, you'll see in a second. So for this, we're gonna switch back to our favorite tool called PowerShell. And this is the second script we're gonna use, and it's very similar. So the first part is identical. Installing the module, setting some variables, connecting to the servers, and over here is where the fun starts. So here we're gonna create a new um, remote app group. So that's happened over here pretty quick. And then we can list all of the applications that are installed on that Windows 10 machine. So we'll get a big list. You can see we have WordPad installed, um, some speech stuff, uh, Windows Media Player, Task Manager. Now, if I scroll up a bit more, at some point in time, we should be able to see Notepad++. Did I went over it? Oh, here it is. Oh, I clicked too hard. <laughs> what are the chances? Okay, let's try again, quicker this time. Here it is. So here you can see that Notepad++, again, nothing you have to do for this. It will just automatically be populated in this list. The only thing you need to do is grab this app alias, and this is needed in order to publish this application as a remote app. So we're gonna execute this command. First, this is where you publish the application with the app alias. So we have a, a group, we added an application to it. Now the next thing what we need to do is add a user who has rights to open up this application. And that's this line number 23, where we're basically saying this other guy, not Ignite at CSPeter, but Ignite RA as in remote app, has access to Notepad++. So let's execute this line. And uh, like I said before, instead of using our HTML5 client, we're now gonna use the um, Windows client. So this is something you can download. It runs on Windows 7 and Windows 10. You hit subscribe. We have to punch in the Azure AD identity credentials. Did I type that correctly? Ignite RA, thank you. And if all goes well, we should have one application, Notepad++. Let's double click it. Now, the first time connection takes slightly longer. But it's pretty amazing, Peter. Like, I mean, you just did a full desktop and remote apps in the same service, natively built. I mean, every other, I mean, you, otherwise you'd need two separate services and you just did it natively in one. Yeah, it's one that all comes with, with the service. So if you want to pu publish a thousand full desktops or remote apps or a mix, it's up to you. So here we got our application um, launched for the first time. And let me just minimize this stuff a little bit. 
Now it kind of behaves like a locally installed application. The thing I like about the Windows client is that it integrates with your start menu. So over here you can see Notepad++ and you can see my tenant name. So from this point on, I don't have to use that Windows client anymore. I can just find it in my start menu. So if you provision this to your end users, maybe they're not even aware that this is an application which is not locally installed, but in this case, it's installed on a VM running in East US 2, and I'm only seeing the output. It behaves like a, a locally installed application. Let me just put something next to it. You know, if I put Notepad, normal Notepad, local next to it, I can uh, copy, copy and paste stuff across. Um, or if you want to block that, that's possible as well. We have policies available that allow you to block this behavior. The only real way to tell that it's not a locally installed application is by this thing over here, which we call the glyph. This is how you can tell that it's a remote app and not locally installed. All right. So that was a quick demo of how to publish a remote application. I picked Notepad++ to show you that it's not just Microsoft software. Any application that is installed or installs on Windows, you can publish, even if it's a modern app, no problems. So for my last demo, I just want to show you uh, Azure Files, um, or FS Logics with Azure Files. So on a normal, I, I kind, kind of, or I, I mentioned it in the beginning a little bit already. On Windows, if you go to C Users, this is where normally your profile resides. In this case, this directory over here is not a local directory. This is the virtual hard drive, which lives outside of the VM and is just mounted across the network to this location. And um, the location is actually over here. So if all goes well, we should be able to browse the network. So this is a UNC share, this is Azure Files, something you can just enable in the portal, I'll quickly show you. And if we drill down over here, we can see it contains a virtual hard drive image or hard disk image. And this thing contains my profile. So just to show you what it looks like, if we go to the Azure portal, you can see I got my storage account where I created um, a storage account called Windows Profiles. And in here is a file share. And I'll zoom in in a second, but there's a share called Profiles, and if I see what's in it, I can see the same content, which is that VHD. Only the user that's logged in has access to this virtual hard drive. So instead of spinning up your own file server, you can now leverage this technology to uh, do that for you. So and the cool thing about it is, if you create your own file server, you need to think about how big are my profiles gonna be in a year from now, or two years. With Azure Files, it can just grow as much as you want. These VHDs, they grow dynamically. So in the beginning, it's fairly small, but it will just grow gradually over time. So with that, let's get back to the deck. So just to recap very quickly what we did, we deployed a full desktop, assigned it to a user, we used the HTML5 client to view the behavior, we used uh, a remote app with the, Win, uh, the Windows client, and we quickly showed how you can use Azure Files with FS Logics. So now let's talk about what's new and what's coming. For some folks, this might look very complicated, like wow, PowerShell, and this is way too techy for me, I just wanna have a UI where I can click through, well, great news, we're working on an Azure portal integration. So this is where in all the stuff that we just did, you can just click, uh, assign extra users, assign desktops, remote apps, assign extra applications. Instead of using PowerShell, this will be available. If you wanna see this thing in action, Scott Manchester has a mechanics live session at 5.35. So just to think it's slightly over an hour when this session ends, and he will show a live demo of this thing. The other, other uh, important fact that Scott announced yesterday in his session is that WVD is now GA. It's available everywhere. We have our management plane deployed in a couple of regions. You can see the US and Europe, but we're not stopping there. Japan is currently being deployed and afterwards oh, will deploy into other regions. A question we get a lot is, when do you deploy our management, your management plane in my uh, geo? The question is, or the, the answer is, you shouldn't wait. You can deploy now, 
we'll use the, the closest management plane. Uh, the performance should be good if you can test it as well. There's a link on this slide, the experience estimator. You can go there and it will show you instantly how much or how big the latency is to the closest management plane. As soon as you deploy your workload, and by the way, you do that in your own subscription. So the VMs, they live in the subscription wherever you want them to be. And as soon as we deploy a management plane closer to you, there's nothing you have to change. We sit behind a thing called Azure Traffic Manager, so we'll just route all the traffic using the new closer management plane. Key takeaway, don't wait, just start deploying today. Who's heard about Aperture? All right, so it's about half. So Aperture has been around for a while and they've been uh, having this promise that whenever you're blocked in your upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10 on physical devices, if an application is working on Windows 7 but not on Windows 10, they will help you. You can call them or create a case and they will take ownership. And when I say take ownership, they go pretty far. They can change the operating system. So if we need to change Windows because an application isn't working, they'll do that. They work with the ISV. They'll reach out to the ISV and work together and make sure that application is changed and so that works on, on Windows 10. Or we use technology like shimming, which kind of fools an application to mimic specific behavior, um, all, all to make sure that the application is running on Windows 10. Now this week we're announcing that they're extending these promises specific for Windows Virtual Desktop. So one is about Windows 10 Enterprise Multi-Session. If you have virtualized apps running today on Windows Server with the remote desktop session host role installed, that should work on Windows 10 Enterprise Multi-Session. And if it doesn't, reach out, they'll open a case, they'll take full ownership, free of charge, and they, they will make it work. The other promise they're making is about apps that are running in your existing VDI environment. So here we're talking about Windows 10 Enterprise, so let's say a single session instead of multi-session. So if you have um, Windows 7 or Windows 10 applications running in a VDI environment, that will run as well on Windows 10 Enterprise as part of WVD. If not, we're here to assist. And the last um, promise that we're making is that apps that are running on physical devices, so Windows 7, will run on Windows 7 as part of WVD, or apps that are running on Windows 10 devices will run on Windows 10 Enterprise as part of WVD. If not, let us know, we'll open the case. So what about the current capabilities and future investments? Um, I'm not gonna spend an awful lot of time on this, on this slide. Just a few things, you can see all of the capabilities. This is not new, it's something we've talked about forever. Um, I mentioned already that we're working on native Azure AD joint VMs and Intune managed. That's one of the key asks we keep on hearing. We're working on Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, for MSIX Appetach, um, there's a, a, a preview that's coming up soon. That's something you can enroll into. And what else do we have? Team support is coming. And the announcement of uh, preview for Azure Stack. Yes, that's a good one as well. So if you have an existing Azure Stack or you're an existing Azure Stack customer, you will be able to enroll into a preview which will allow you to run Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session on-premises as part of Azure Stack. So with that, um, John already mentioned at the beginning of uh, the session that we have a special guest. During that logo slide, you might have spotted Ferguson is on there. So I'd like to welcome to the stage from Ferguson, Scott Wright. All right, Scott, well, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, can I ask you to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, uh, my name's Scott Wright. I work for uh, Ferguson Enterprises. I've been there for about 11 years. Um, I'm currently the uh, cloud architect in the environment, um, working especially in the virtualization and uh, Azure space. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the desktop virtualization journey that Ferguson went through? Yeah, so we started our journey about two and a half to three months ago, um, looking at Windows virtualization um, from the desktop perspective. Um, we did an analysis of our application stack, um, you know, working with our developers um, and some of our ERP, our ERP application in that space, and, and looking at how we could adopt Windows Virtual Desktop from the perspective of getting people closer to the data, the data locality, as far as migrating our applications into the cloud. 
And how long did it took you, like a full? Um, uh, I would say probably set? from the time we stood it up to the time we actually were using it, um, probably anywhere from about two weeks maybe to three tops. That's pretty quick, yeah, yeah. if you compare it with traditional From a POC OES, perspective uh, and having users access it, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so. great. Um, so why did you choose WVD and what caused you to change your existing solution? Um, so again, looking at you know the things like remote app, non-persistent desktop, persistent desktop, we really looked at um, our integrated associates that sit at, you know, we have 26,000 employees wor worldwide, right? So we looked at some of our integrated associates and how we can help get them into our ERP. They're utilizing customer computers at customer sites. Uh, we also looked at our development stack and how our developers today can access their environments. Um, so with the announcement of, you know, additional regions in Azure for WVD, right, that will be a, 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 a game changer for us. You know, that will help us with our third party, our offshore, um, additionally, we also looked at our mergers and acquisitions and really looked at how we can change the way that, you know, we get our mergers and acquisitions into our environment, accessing our systems immediately instead of waiting days or weeks. So you mentioned a few already, but what are the key use cases that you use WVD for? Yeah, so our, our RDS environment, uh, we really looked at how we could, you know, eliminate things like VPN access, jump stations, um, our developers looking to get them into Azure Kubernetes services and actually, you know, doing their development in AKS um, in that stack. Um, also, we looked at um, some of our other use cases, like our fire and fabrication division, how we can get them. Um, you know, they, there's about a thousand employees in our fire and fabrication division that sit across the country. Um, getting them into their environment, accessing their systems and their applications. That actually utilizes Azure Files um, and Azure File Sync in that space. So we're looking at adopting that. We also looked, we have a GPU use case um, with some of our uh, CAD or rendering drawings that some of our associates need to use. So we looked at how we could do that with Azure File, Azure File Sync, and getting those, uh, getting those applications or the, that data off of our existing DFS infrastructure and into the cloud. And how do you manage uh, costs in Azure? How do you make sure it doesn't just explode and you kind of control that? Yeah, so that's an interesting question, right? So we looked at how we can um, use Azure automation, right? So we're using variables, we're using workflows in the environment, um, looking at how you know we could shut down the machines when associates are not using them. Um, so in our POC, we actually um, set up Azure automation to do um, you know startup and shutdown of our systems um, either overnight, over the weekends. Uh, we also looked at things at the reserved instance. So what you guys had uh, referenced earlier around reserved instance with the capabilities of, you know, paying as you go or, you know, on a monthly basis, we looked at, you know, reserved instance in one year and three year to really drive down those costs. Uh, we also looked at how we can, you know, stack more with, you know, with less, I guess, if you will, or, you know, stack more of our systems and our applications into remote apps and non-persistent desktops. That way we're not spinning up full-blown desktops except for where we need to with the case of like our GPU and our, and our, um, and our GPU rendering systems. Okay, great. So one last question. If you had a magic wand, what kind of feature or features do you want to add today? Yeah, so I think for us, it, we're a big team shop. Um, you know, so for us, we would like to see the adoption of Teams as potentially even a remote app and utilizing the audio and video capabilities um, either through a remote app or a non-persistent desktop. Um, that, that would definitely be a big one for us. Uh, we did install it on our persistent desktops, worked very well, we were able to do Teams chat and you know, utilize Teams from a file sharing perspective, but the audio and video capability would be great, as well as it looks like through the portal now we're gonna be able to do things like you know, the, uh, the group memberships and adding users into the groups as opposed to just assigning them through PowerShell into the host pools. Okay, great, yeah, Teams is definitely something we're working on yep. very hard. Yeah, so we're very excited about that. Stay, stay tuned. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. And uh, make sure you enjoy the event. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so before we wrap up, three things. Um, get started today. You can see one of the links over here. Um, we, the link that you see in the middle is something we shared already. You can test your experience by going to this website. And lastly, if you want to have an indication on the amount of costs that um, WVD will, will charge you or will, uh, <laughs> will have that support, that sounded a lot better in my head. Um, but anyway, you can kind of get an indication of the total costs by using the WVD pricing link. Scan the QR code to find everything or to get the latest information. Next up, 
is the session from Scott Manchester, Mechanics Live. I think it will be very busy, so make sure you arrive early. And with that, I want to thank everyone and make sure you have a great event.